So we said there's three elements to performance, delivery, conformity, and payment. We've talked about delivery, and now we turn to conformity. Remember, the, the seller has an obligation to deliver conforming goods. And essentially what this means is the seller must deliver the goods that were called for in the contract. And we know what the, what the scope of that means is that the goods must match in quantity, quality, and description those goods that were anticipated in the contract. And those goods must be contained in, or packaged in a manner that is required by the contract. So when we talk about conforming of goods, we want to make sure that the goods that are delivered are going to match the goods, the description of the goods in the contract. Conformity is closely related to the idea of warranty. And, and, and you've all had experience with the idea of warranty and what warranty means. Well, a warranty is essentially a guarantee of conformity that I guarantee that the goods will match that uh, description in the contract and to ensure that I meet that guarantee, I agree to be bound by that obligation. So that's a warranty. A warranty is a guarantee of conformity. Now we know that goods do not conform with the contract unless they are first fit for the purposes for which goods of the same description would ordinarily be used. Now we have the same concept in the United States under the UCC. The UCC has a concept and maybe you heard it in your introductory legal studies course or if you've taken uh, the commercial transactions course, but there's a term called merchantability. And what merchantability means is that when the parties agree to uh, the sale of goods, those goods will at a minimum match or be uh, useful for the same purposes as ordinary goods of those times. Even if there's no express warranty included in the contract, the fact is if we have a contract that calls for the shipment of 500 TVs and it turns out that a hundred of the TVs don't work when you plug them in, that breaches the guarantee of conformity. That invokes the warranty because the good, the TV, doesn't work like it's supposed to work. So. We know they don't conform with the contract unless they match the standard of merchantability. And again, that's, that's the same here in the United States. It must be fit for the ordinary purpose of the item. Now the second qualification is they may be uh, fit for a particular purpose. In the UCC, we call this the warranty of fitness for a particular purpose. And what it says is that if the seller guaranteed that the product would match a particular use as opposed to a general use for these type of, of, uh, of goods, then the seller is going to be bound by that promise, even though the good may be sufficient for uh, ordinary purposes, if the seller has made an, uh, a promise, essentially, that it will meet a particular purpose, and if the buyer relied on that promise, then it's not conforming unless it meets the particular purpose that was called for in the contract. And again, for uh, an example, let's look at TVs again. If I, as a seller, am selling TVs, ordinarily, I'm only responsible for if the TVs match what an ordinary TV would do, the ordinary standards for a TV. If, however, I'm contacted by a buyer and they say we want to install monitors throughout our, our new building 
and these monitors are going to run 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and therefore we need uh, monitors that are going to handle that sort of workload. And I sell them monitors or TVs. I am required to sell them TVs that will meet that standard because the buyer made it known that's what they needed. That's what they were interested in. So in this case, I, if I sell them monitors that are, that are ordinary, that if they were used as a TV would be fine, but they don't meet this advanced purpose, those monitors are not conforming. So warranty for a particular purpose. And finally, if I have provided a sample, if a seller has provided a sample to the buyer, the actual product must match the qualities of the sample. So if I am selling textiles, for instance, and um, I'm, I'm selling fabric, and I give an example of a fabric, and I, they order this particular fabric, the good that I deliver must match the quality of the fabric that I used as a sample. Even if the fabric I deliver is merchantable, unless it matches those same qualities, it is not conforming for purposes of the CISG. So conformity, three ways a, 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 a good must be con, uh, construed as conforming. Fit for ordinary purposes, fit for a particular purpose, or possess the qualities of the sample. Now, when the seller delivers the goods, when the seller makes the delivery, whatever it is, uh, either according to the terms of the contract or according to the terms of the CISG, what that does is it immediately triggers an obligation on the part of the buyer. The buyer has an obligation to inspect the goods and then notify the seller of any non-conformity. So once the seller delivers the goods, it's the buyer's responsibility to inspect the goods and to determine if they are conforming or not. Now there's two time periods involved here. There is the inspection time period and there is the notice time period. And the CISG makes these two periods, examination and notice, separate, even though it may seem more logical to just have one time period. But in essence, this, what this means is that for a buyer, you have two obligations. You must inspect the goods as soon as you can or within a reasonable time. And if you detect a nonconformity, you must notify the seller of the nonconformity within a reasonable time. And this reasonable time standard is, uh, is hard to pin down. The law is clear that there is no definite time period that we're going to consider a reasonable time. A reasonable time is going to depend on the circumstances of this particular sale, the circumstances of past dealings between the parties, the circumstances of how the industry itself works. A reasonable time could be different from one industry to the next, from one seller and buyer to the next seller and buyer. So it's impossible to narrow down this idea of a reasonable time, but in essence it means according to past standards, either from the industry or from the dealings, did the buyer do what it was supposed to do within a time period that was no longer than what was reasonable under the circumstances. So the buyer's obligation to examine the goods begins to run immediately upon delivery. After the period for examination closes, the period of timely notice begins. And 
both standards have to be met. It's not enough that the buyer inspected the goods and discovered a nonconformity. The buyer must have notified the seller of the nonconformity. So if the defect can be discovered only upon use, again, the buyer has a reasonable period of time from the time of first use to notify the seller. If the buyer fails to give timely notice, timely and proper notice, the buyer may lose the right to assert a breach against the seller. It, if the buyer hasn't met its obligation to inspect the goods and provide notice of a nonconformity, the buyer may not be able to bring a suit for breach, even though the seller has not performed according to the terms of the contract. So this responsibility of the buyer is, uh, is huge and has repercussions. So for you in, in your work life, understand that if you order goods, you have this obligation to look at the goods, ensure conformity, and if they don't conform, you must notify the seller as soon as possible. Now, the notice of nonconformity should be specific. It should state specifically how the goods are not are nonconforming. Provide enough details so that the seller is aware of why the goods are nonconforming, why the goods don't conform with the contract. So when you provide this notice of conformity, it must be specific. It must be in great detail as to why the goods are non-conforming. And the reason why we have this requirement is that the seller will have a right to cure the breach. We'll talk a lot more about this when we get to remedies, but in essence, it gives to the seller the right to send substitute goods that do match what was called for in the contract. Sellers essentially have a second bite at the apple, meaning if they missed it the first time, they may be able to avoid liability by immediately sending substitute goods that do conform, substitute conforming goods.